Karate friends, welcome to Classics in Color, your weekly dive into some of the ancient world's wackiest facts. I'm Mark Graves, and today we're talking about Solon and his creation of public brothels in Athens. So a great resource for this, if you want to read more, is Anne Burnett's article, Brothels, Boys, and the Athenian Adonia, which is a festival and we'll get to in a second. First, I just want to paint a picture for you of the culture of ancient Athens. So young adult male citizens, is important, their class and everything, uh, did not generally get married until late 20s, early 30s. Up until that point, they're very much under the thumb of their father and also under his mentorship. They are usually serving for a while in the military, uh, working on their career, etc. So they do not get married until a little bit later in life, whereas Athenian female citizens uh, get married much younger. They get married around 14, 15-ish. Uh, so there's a bit of a gap there and also there's a gap of time in between when uh, young men are starting to grow up and when they actually get married and have sort of a sanctioned outlet for their sexual urges, so to speak. Uh, and so in between that time, you can imagine that they and the people around them wanted an outlet for them to sort of express themselves and get that out. But there weren't a lot of options because if they messed with or had an affair with a woman who was already married, then they could be killed, they could be castrated, lots of bad things could happen to them. These women were kept very secure and I made a whole video about that. And similarly, if you messed with a woman who was not yet married, they were also very protected and the father would be very angry if you messed with their virginity pre-marriage. Then there was the lower classes, right, of servants and slaves, but you weren't supposed to mess with them either because the way society worked worked at this time was the head of the household, the pater, um, sorry, that's Latin, the head of the household had sort of sexual privileges with all of his slaves, sorry to say, but uh, any of the, the maids or the workers in his, in his house he was entitled to or often would have little sexual relations with. And so it would be weird and taboo for his son to also mess with the maid, if that makes sense. And there, there would be a similar problem if he went and messed with the neighbor's maid, right? The neighbor would probably be mad about that. So doesn't have any options there. There were some freelance prostitutes who apparently worked in the city, but they might be a little sketchy. <laughs> they might not be very clean or very attractive or might have diseases or might just be a little crazy, you know, whatever. And so the families of these young men didn't really want them messing with the, the freelance prostitutes. So what Solon, who was this great lawgiver and statesman of Athens did was he created these public brothels and he got a lot of praise and credit for this which is not something we normally think of, right? We don't think of, oh yes, the time that George Washington instituted all those brothels wasn't that great. Uh, so very different mindset on their part, but it provided a very important social function in that it gave these young men an outlet and also kind of an education. It sort of served as a transition for them from childhood to adulthood. So we're gonna look into that in more detail. So we have some more information about these brothels in detail. One of the, one of the quotes comes from a comic play called the Brothers by Philemon, and it goes, You purchased women and fixed them in various places, equipped and ready for all. They stand there naked, you won't be deceived, look at all parts. Not quite yourself, and tortured by lust, the door is wide open. Pay down an oval and hop right inside. There's no trumped up prudery, no trifling, no running away, but straight off, the one that you want, just how you want her. Leave and tell her to cry, she's nothing to you. So these women are all dolled up, so they're healthy and attractive, and when it says equipped, um, it can imply several things among them, you know, being perfumed, so being all made up, uh, but it can also imply being equipped with different contraceptive amulets and such. So these women are also expected to know and use contraceptive technologies and a and also abortion. So you don't want tons of bastards running around, so this is another way for society to sort of control the sexual uh, urges and actions of men. And of course, these women are also sort of idealized in a way, right? You can have them however you want them, and you can leave them whenever you want them. So, and again, this is a comedy, so we always have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's an interesting passage nonetheless. Some other things we know about these brothels and the women who worked in them is that for one, they were often positioned near temples to Aphrodite so that they could worship her in particular, which makes sense, and that they also took part in 
no more normal parts of life, not just an Aphrodite stuff, but their brothels were often called Ergasterion, which means workshop, and when they weren't performing sexual acts, they might work on weaving and sewing and such and make a little money on the side there and sometimes even buy their freedom because most, if not all of them, were slaves. And then we also have another quote from a comedy uh, about how apparently they particularly liked the youngest clients. So when young men would come in around 14, 15, they um, would really be hospitable to them, shall we say. So the quote goes, you don't need to sneak into a Freeman's house. If you're young, the, these ladies will call you little brother. So I guess they just thought they were really cute, would give them a discount and some really grade A treatment. So as I said, going to a brothel was seen as sort of a big deal as a transition from childhood to adulthood, and there's a trope in literature of madams of these brothels being sort of mentor figures who sort of, sort of initiate young men into the world of adulthood, who show them how life really is, that sort of thing. And then we also have um, paintings, uh, a vase painting of a father escorting his son into one of these brothels, and he takes him to Patho, who is a, the goddess of persuasion and seduction. She's a handmaid of Aphrodite and he hands over money to her and presumably he's paying for his son to have his first experience with a woman and to have this big transition into adulthood. So it's just very weird that his father is there and paying for it, at least from a modern perspective. And if you think about it, men generally would all use the same brothel that was in the same vicinity, so the father and the son could be interacting with the same prostitutes, which is just, uh, so let's not think about that too hard. <laughs> so what did the women in Athens think about all these shenanigans, right? Uh, well, there was this festival called the Adonia. It's named after Adonis, who was the son of Mira, who had sex with her father. Very weird myth. And she tur was turned into a tree, and she gave birth to Adonis as she was a tree. He sort of burst out of it. And apparently he was the most beautiful beautiful baby ever and he grew up to be the most handsome guy and uh, Aphrodite actually fell in love with him and they dated for a little while but then he was killed by a wild boar and she was very sad about it and she turned his blood into flowers. So that is sort of the myth that is related to this ritual. But the festival is a women-only thing, and what's really weird about it is the citizen women interact with the prostitute women. They all hang out together, separate from men, and part of it is that they have a really good time, right? They joke around, they dance on the rooftops, and they plant these little flowers from the Adonis story, but they plant them in just these pot shards, not a whole pot, which is a little bit of dirt, so the flowers pop up, but then they die right away. And I have heard some scholars argue that this is women making fun of men not being able to last very long, but uh, Anne makes a different argument here. So what she says is that this is a very bittersweet sort of festival. Though on the one hand, it's women coming together and celebrating men and having sex with men and the citizen women being grateful that these prostitutes are providing sort of a safe outlet for their sons and they're also checking in on them a little bit to remind them like hey make sure that you're doing your contraception stuff right and the prostitutes are also you know celebrating these men that they get to have relationships with but it's also bitter because when men come of age they can no longer hang out with the women in the women's quarters you know when they're a little kid they can hang out with their mom but when they become men their mom and their sister and everything are sort of separated from them and they have to go off into the men's world so it's sort of a sad thing for the female family that's left behind and also the prostitutes although they get to interact with these men a lot more now they don't have any sort of hold on them so on both sides it's sort of a sad regret it's losing the men in your life that you love so it's a very interesting festival and I really love uh, Anne's argument about what it sort of means and what the function of it is in society. Thank you so much for checking out this video on ancient brothels in Athens. Thank you so much to patrons and subscribers. I hope to see all of you again next week. Karate!